Just get us on work. Turn to page number 243. Page number 243, and I'm going to let you sit down tonight. You don't have to stand up. You stood up enough this morning, so. <laughs> Victory in Jesus, 243. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him, and all my love is through him. He plunged me to victory. Thy cleansing blood. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came, brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. Heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. How about the angels singing and the old redemption story? Some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. redeeming blood he loved me ever I knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood third page number 127 page number 127 Take mine down, my mic down just a little bit, please. Yeah, I think that's better. Sound like I'm popping on, on here. All right, 127. sweet to trust in Jesus to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, how I trust Him. I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. For trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Just Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me. Me to the end. Just Jesus, how I trust Him. I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, for grace to trust Him more. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you this evening for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. We just pray, Lord, this evening for uh, those whose names we called this morning. This is uh, uh, Brenda's sister-in-law, Diana, uh, my aunt, and uh, Arbely, and uh, Nicole, who lost uh, the baby uh, this morning as well. Lord, as others I know, they are sick and Frank is sick. And Lord, there's a lot of things going around. But, uh, I just pray, Father, that you touch bodies here and raise them up. Uh, Lord, that you meet each and every need. Father, for us to open requests that you need to do so. Uh, ask for there, Lord, you know what the need is. You know uh, what the answer to that need is. So we just do what you do for those answers. Then, Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the service tonight. You speak to our hearts and encourage us and strengthen us. Through the word this evening, so it's going to bring good. And then, Heavenly Father, we just pray, uh, Lord, that our hearts be united with, uh, with yours. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God will have what we get to us and uh, speak, uh, speak to us in the needs of the heart. Uh, we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I uh, appreciate you being here tonight. It's good to see Brother Philip back. And after he uh, did his rendition in the, in the foyer, I was thinking, well, maybe he needs to go back again <laughs> somewhere else. Just kidding, Brother Philip. But he's he's got one of those dry sense of humor that uh, that people don't appreciate. I mean, people appreciate. <coughs> but uh, uh, anyway, uh, good to have him back for for a little while. We don't know how long, long we're going to be blessed with him. But, uh, anyway, he'll be here and uh, be praying for him for the next job that comes available. Uh, I told him, I said, you know, I sent you a message back you know, two or three weeks ago. A friend of mine. Uh, one of my former students actually uh, put on Facebook that they were taking applications and resumes for uh, certified security uh, uh, for the safety men. And uh, I thought I, I just made it and sent it to him, but he said he didn't get that. I think he'd be pretty good. I'm just picking on him. But anyway, uh, uh, he, he seems to find those jobs far, far away. Be in prayer for him for the next job that comes available. Uh, don't forget to pray. Um, Frankie is still sick, and uh, I sent her a text message a while ago, and so we missed her, and she's missing being here. Uh, Miss Brenda's uh, sister-in-law, she's kind of like a mother to Miss Brenda, uh, as they, she woke up uh, the day this last week, I think it's Tuesday, but she didn't wake up. She was not responsive. Uh, they put her in the ICU, and uh, she woke up. About that, but then she kind of went back out. And uh, Miss Brenda's in San Antonio uh, right now. And so, uh, be in prayer. Uh, her name is uh, Diana Van. Have my prayer list here somewhere. Diana Van Blerick. That's why I can remember. Uh, so, uh, anyway, be in prayer for her as well. Uh, I know it's not. Patty Sanchez was sick yesterday, uh, and they had a birthday party for the little girl, <laughs> and uh, she said, I'm not excited about this one at all, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, be in prayer for her. Uh, and 
Edgar had been sick as well as I had, and we kind of went through it together, but uh, you know, she was not feeling very well at all. There's a lot of folks going around with all this crud, and uh, because the weather is 80 degrees one day, 40 the next, and uh, so uh, this is stuff that we deal with in Southeast Texas. Uh, so be a fair one for another, and then of course this evening, following the service after we say all of our final amens and all of that, and uh, those who are members of the church over here on this side and uh, we we'll just have a little bit of business to take care of and uh, we will not uh, keep you long and uh, let you know after we make known all the information uh, so we will play for that alright if you're visiting this night we will thank you for being here uh, and let you know we appreciate you being here if you're visiting with us tonight there's a card right in the front uh, in the pocket right in front of you uh, if you fill that out put it in the offer plate and come by a little bit we'll have to recommend you to visit with us <coughs> Turn to page number 118. Page number 118. I saw Stan will have some men, co men to come forward, receive the offering on the last course. 118. Near to the heart of God. Anybody here tonight want to be near to the heart of God? I hope so. That's what we're here for. Amen? Uh, if you're wondering why I'm wearing a tie that has Christmas trees on it, there's two reasons. First of all, it looks good with this outfit. And second, it's, it's really a, a protest because it should not be 80 degrees in February. I, God has given over the southeast Texas weather to Satan. I'm sure of it. Anyway, I thank you all for being here tonight. It is a blessing to have you all. And uh, I am, again, thankful to see you. I don't know what's going to come next. It, it just it, it hit there and nothing. My brain stopped. So uh, I'm not sure what I was going to say. But y'all imagine it was something witty and charming. And y'all go, wow. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> probably not, sadly. Your, your imagination is probably far better than what I was going to come up with, so it's okay. So as we receive the offering tonight, uh, do remember to be thankful that you have something from which you can return 10% to the Lord, and uh, because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I'm going to ask Brother Richard Priest to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we come to you once again this evening. Just thank you so much for this beautiful day and the honor and privilege of being in your house to honor and glorify you and to uh, meet with friends and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We just ask you, Lord, to be with Brother Kirk this evening and as he breaks the bread of life to us, Lord, to give him the words that touch each and every one of our hearts, Lord, that we want to come near to you. 
We just ask you now, Lord, to take this offering, receive it, multiply it, and use it for the purpose of your service. Yes, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm surprised that you showed up during the house of preaching. Uh, if you would, open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Thank you. My Bible has little tabs, so I can find it pretty easy. 1 Peter, chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to start off by uh, saying that normally I... Uh, is this too loud for you? promise that. <laughs> um, I'm, it's rather warm. I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I apologize. Um, first of all, I want to start saying, normally I, I preach, as you all know, to uh, prisoners. I go once a month to jail, and most of my sermons are written in that manner. Um, and this was written back in October to be preached to prisoners, but I believe that this message is not specifically for prisoners is for everyone. And um, if you get offended by anything that I say tonight, I uh, want you to know that I did not pick out this message for you. In fact, I did not pick it out at all. I believe that the Lord picked this out and told me to preach it. Um, and I am not thinking of anyone or anything because this is the sort of message that some people can get offended by. Um, so, I mean, my last message I preached to you was on Batman, and it's been a year and a half, so I'm not sure... Anyway, that's just a joke. Uh, book of First Peter. And I've got seven points, so I'm going to try to hurry to get through them all in the time, our normal time period. So if I go too fast, please forgive me. Uh, I do tend to talk Texan, and when I speed up, uh, my accent kind of goes away. So if y'all can kind of listen not Texan for a little bit, uh, y'all might get more. Anyway, the book of First Peter, chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 13 through 16. If you would, please go ahead and stand with me to honor the reading of the Word of God. Book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Still hear some pages turning, so I'll give it just a minute. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. The Word of God says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but he, as he which is, hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. My dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity I have to stand up and bring your word, as, as I never feel good enough or worthy enough for to preach. I don't know why you called me. I'm no one special. I am nothing special, Lord God. If, if my 46 years on this planet has taught me anything, it's that. Uh, my pride and my arrogance drove me into a place that I should never have gone, and you pulled me out. And Lord, I stand before you a broken man who exists simply because you will it, simply because of your love. And Lord God, as I preach tonight, please fill me full of the Holy Spirit and your love. And I pray everybody get from this message exactly what you would have them to. Lord, I am afraid that this message could offend people. And Lord, I don't mean it to, and you know my heart. But I know the way some people think sometimes, and they take things as 
you're, you're preaching at them like I've been going through their garbage. Or something. And you know that's not true. And if anyone here, my Lord God, if this touches them in a way that, that they need it, my Lord, I pray that it not be in an offensive way, but in a way of love. In a way that uh, just reaches people. It reaches the soul. And that people change, my Lord God, in the way that you need them. That you need them. To, that they need themselves to change. Like Job needed you. To. I do ask you, please fill me full of the Holy Spirit, my Lord. And please touch each one of us. I pray that each one of us leads you closer to you, Lord God. And I pray that you, your name, is high and lifted up in our hearts and our minds, would you please bless you. Lord, we thank you for all you do and are going to do in the precious name of Christ Jesus. Amen. I would like to preach tonight on the subject of seven Christians you should not be. Seven Christians you should not be. Now, before I start, each one of my uh, uh, seven outlines, my seven points, has a story that goes along with it, and because I drive a lot, uh, all of them except for one are about driving. So I hope that everybody can really understand these points, uh, because I think most of, in, most of us in here drive, or have driven at least some point in our life. Uh, so without uh, beating around the bush anymore, let me go ahead and get on with it. It is a biblical fact that Christians are to act a certain way. This fact seems to be well understood by everyone in America except Christians. In fact, I've seen several memes floating around the internet showing the opulence of some groups of Christians saying that these people are hypocrites because there are so many poor and starving people in the world and these Christians are so rich. While I disagree with these memes, and I can show you in the Bible where Christians are not responsible for ending poverty, in fact, Jesus says you will have the poor with you always, the world knows that a Christian should be better than everyone else. They know that Christians are directed to a higher standard. God has directed us to be, quote, holy in all manner of conversation, which is the way we live. Holy in all manner of conversation. Unfortunately, most American Christians don't seem to get that. What most Christians want to do is clean up the stuff that they don't like, but hold on to the sins that they do like. We're all for giving up smoking crack cocaine, but not so big on giving up smoking cigarettes. We think people should not drink Drano, but want to keep slugging back the alcohol. We get offended when other people curse at us, but we are more than willing to let loose a string of profanity every time we get upset. These and all other issues in a Christian's life result from old sinful habits that creep out into our everyday lives. I'd like to talk about for a few minutes these sinful attitudes that seem very prevalent, prevalent, that word, in American Christianity. These are things that we each need to address from time to time in our lives. Everybody has some of these issues come up and we need to make sure we address them from time to time. This is by no means a comprehensive list. There are many more ways we can improve, but this is a really good start. Seven Christians you should not be. Number one, don't be the arrogant Christian. The arrogant Christian. Oh, that's nice, it just changed pages on me. All right, let's try that again. Sorry. Yeah, technology. That just that worked well, didn't it? There we go. Try that again. The arrogant Christian. Matthew 23, 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So let me give you an example of an arrogant Christian. Like I said, I drive a lot. I'm driving through Houston, and every day driving through Houston, there is somebody at some point going lower than the speed limit in the passing lane. 
always. And there's signs to say left lane for passing only. But they're there, and they're not. In fact, everybody's going around them. Everybody's going around them. They don't care that they're impacting everyone else. They're right all the time. Let me tell you an example of somebody. I was in uh, uh, a driver's course one time. I used to have to take quite a lot of them. I was in a driver's course one time, and the instructor starts off, and he says, what is your pet peeve? What is your pet peeve? And I said, I said this, people who are in the left-hand lane not passing. In the state of Texas, the left-hand lane on multi-lane roads is for passing only. It's a law in the state of Texas. And there was a lady in there. She got mad. She was not happy about that statement. She turned and she looked at me and said, well, I'm driving the speed limit, so nobody else should be passing me. I, I, I'm sorry, that's, that's not the law. The law isn't if you're driving the speed limit, you can use the left-hand lane. The law is if you're driving in, if you're passing someone, you use the left. She didn't let me finish. I'm driving the speed limit. You need to be passing me. Okay, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. But we did have this um, discourse. And the instructor had to jump in and stop it because neither one of us were given an inch. Uh, she was extraordinarily upset that someone would point out her arrogance that she was driving in the left hand lane. She was right. She was following the law. Oh, not that one part that says she shouldn't be driving in there, but the other laws, she, right? We get that way. Why can't you look at that? You know, I can't believe they're doing that. I would never do that. Well, yeah, I know you'd never do that, but don't you do this. Hey, 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 no, no. Look at what they're doing. Wait a minute. We're all sinners. Don't get arrogant. I see it so much. And... I experience my own arrogance. I get that way. Man, I can't believe that person said that or did that. Well, that it's been years since I would do anything like that, so obviously I'm better. But that's a wrong attitude. That is a kind of Christian we should not be. That does not help anyone. No one knows everything. Don't act like you do. Because we don't. We don't know everything. You know, many people, even ones newer in the faith than you, can teach you something. You can learn. They may have something that God has given them that you haven't been ready for yet, but they're ready for it. We need to be willing to learn and grow to learn and grow. We need to learn and grow in Christ. We need to be able be willing to learn and grow at your job. You're not the best person who's ever done your job position. Period. I mean, you're not. So, you might be the best person at your job, but you're not the best person who's ever done your job. Anywhere and everywhere, if that makes sense. Don't be thinking that you're all that. That does not help the cause of Christ. People don't, unsaved people don't look at you and see your arrogance and think, wow, I want to be like that guy. No. That does not help the cause of Jesus Christ. Look, he did it again. That's what happens when you get a new tablet. It just goes all kind of wonky on you. Be willing to learn and grow as a husband, as a wife, as a spouse, as a child. As a child, I'm a grown adult. If your parents are alive, you're still a child. Still. You are still their child. I got three grown adult children now. That'll make you feel old. I got three adult children now. They're still my children. 
I'm still my mom and dad's child. I need to learn how to be better. I've got 46 years of experience of being their child. I still need to get better at it. And they're more than happy to tell us that, aren't they? So don't be the arrogant Christian. Number two, the scaredy cat Christian. The scaredy cat Christian, Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Don't be a scaredy cat Christian. Example. Person driving down the road, Going along, they're passing people, right? They're doing good, they're going fast. Got nothing between them, they're driving along, they're doing great. Going along, here comes somebody right here, and again. And boy, they're just driving along, here comes somebody, boy, slow down, uh, half a mile an hour. They slowly pass them, just barely pass them by. Takes five minutes to pass one car, then speed up again. They're afraid. Somebody else on the road. They're afraid. Now, I don't know how long they've been driving. I don't know if it's a new driver or someone who maybe their their vision and their reactions aren't what they used to be, so they're a little afraid of it. Or maybe it's people who just aren't paying attention. My college roommate was infamous for that. He would just he'd be talking to me and he'd drive along and he'd get right next to somebody and just match their speed. And I looked at him and go, John! They go, ah, sorry, wake up. Don't be afraid to do what needs to be done. We are commanded to be bold. It's not a gift that God gives you. It's a commandment you're supposed to adhere to. God doesn't say, I'll give you boldness. God says, be bold. Do it. Yeah, I know you're afraid. It's okay do it. That's what faith is. Do it. You're not always going to be comfortable with the things you need to do for Christ. God's going to call you to do things. In fact, I can guarantee God is going to call you to do stuff that is out of your comfort zone. That's what He does. He takes people who can't do something and he turns them into people who are magnificent at it. But in order to get magnificent at it, you first got to try and do it. Don't be a scaredy cat Christian. Sometimes in our lives things will be easy and sometimes they'll be hard. That's just the way it works. I wish everything would be easy. I wish I was comfortable with everything I needed to do. I'm not. You're not. Sometimes things don't make us happy. You gotta do them anyway. Fear is the tool of Satan. God doesn't give you fear. He gives you, or rather, He tells you to be bold. And He's with you. He says, I'm with you. Go ahead, take the step. I'm right here. It's like a parent holding their, their little kid's hand, trying to get them to take that step. They, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. That's what God's telling us. I got gotcha. you. Just take the step. Be bold. Do it. You know, the apostles weren't smart men. In that time period, in the Jewish culture, what happened was everybody went to the same school and you learned the Torah. And after a certain point, if you weren't excelling, you didn't go any further. They just, you, you're out of school now. Just go do something else. And it went along like that. And only the best of the best got to be the Pharisees. Everybody else got kicked out. You're, you're not good enough. You can't be a leader. You're not, you're not good enough. That's what the, the fishermen were. They weren't good enough. Yet here are these men that their culture says you're not smart enough, you're not good enough. God says, I have chosen you. 
and they stand before those that society says is smart enough, is good enough, and you know what they did? They took them to school. And they told them exactly what the Bible said, exactly what God wanted, and they took everything the Sanhedrin court believed and trashed it because they knew the Bible, they knew God better than the court did. That's what God wants to do with you. But you're afraid. I'm with you. I'm afraid. New territory. New ground. Be bold. Don't be a scaredy cat Christian. Don't be a scaredy cat Christian. Number, the third kind of Christian not to be is the unwise Christian. The unwise Christian. James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. An unwise Christian. There's an exit. I work, as you all know, I work over on the west side of Houston. And the I right, work right near Katy. Katy is on the west side of the Beltway, and I work right there on the Peter Road on the right-hand side. And there are, I think, six uh, ways to go from Katy over to that side. And, and the Katy area right there is, is mostly houses. And you cross over to the, excuse me, the inside the, the, of the Beltway, and then you have all the businesses. So you have lots of people going back and forth each day. Right? The biggest intersection right there, for reasons I have no idea, but the most used intersection is Clay Road. Everybody and their mama wants to go through Clay Road. I have no idea why. But they do. That's where they want to go. They want to go down Clay Road. Now, if you've been to that side of town, you know that the Beltway takes off, has these exit ramps that go off of each one of these roads. Now, Clay Road is about three to four times busier than every other crossway. Again, no idea why. But people love to, in this hugely compacted intersection, people like to come off the beltway on that exit ramp and try to get over three lanes of traffic so they can take a right on the clay road when there are five other roads that they could go down and get there a lot easier. In fact, 18 wheelers like to come off that thing and try to force their way over three lanes of traffic so they can take a right. Seriously? This is what you thought was a good idea? You woke up this morning and went, man, I'm going to cut off everybody. That, that, that's what you thought was going to be a good idea. Sadly, I look around at a lot of Christians and the way they, we live our lives, the way we don't rely on God for things, the way we never ask God for the wisdom He gives. And I'm like, really? That's what you thought was the best idea? And I really, a lot of times I want to go up to people and say, excuse, excuse me, that, what you're doing right here, that, that you're going on right here. Um, how many times have you followed James 1, 5 and asked for wisdom on this? Because I'm betting, just guessing, the answer is zero. Because I don't think you'd be continuing on this path if you had. I may be wrong. It's not my job God's given to me. But I got to wonder because from the outside, this doesn't look like an intelligent move. You see, we love to think we know how to do things. We love to be the kind of Christian got it going on. I can do Every Sunday morning, I sit right there. Well, nearly every Sunday morning, I sit right there. And I interpret for our death. If I don't ask God for the ability to do that every Sunday, there is a difference. The difference is between me doing it mostly okay and me sitting there like this. 
Because the wisdom to be able to do that is from the Lord. Now, if I can't sit over there and do something that I have been doing for well nigh 10 years now, if I can't do that without God helping me, how much more everyday little things am I going to need Him for? How much more everything, everyday things am I going to need His touch on, His help with, His wisdom on? Y'all know I love James 1.5. Because, as I often say, James 1.5 is the only verse in the Bible that promises four things about something. Only verse in the Bible, these four things, that He will give it to everybody who asks, that, I forgot what it is. <laughs> Give to everybody who asks. He's going to give you more than what you ask for. He's going to, uh, he'll never chastise you for asking about it. And he's going to give it to you every time. Right? Every, every time. That's the only thing in the Bible God says, every time you ask me, I'm going to give it to you. You only need salvation once. The first time you ask, it's done. Wisdom, you need it again and again and again and again. God says, you ask, you keep asking, I'll keep giving. I'll never say no. I'll never say, what? I did that six times already today, again? No. He says, upbraideth not. I'm never going to challenge you on it. I'm going to give it to everybody who asks every time they ask. I'm never going to say no. I'm always going to give you more than what you think you need. Always, always. Wisdom is the, one of the things that really separates us from the world. Because we can have the wisdom of God, and they can't. But can have is the operative word. If you're not asking God for the wisdom to do the things in your life, you are have no more thought on it than an unsafe person. Why would you have the great, not have the greatest mind possible giving you what you need to succeed? Why would you not? So don't be the unwise Christian. Number four, the unchanging Christian. That's the kind of Christian we should not be. We should not be an unchanging Christian. Hebrews 5.12 says, for when, you, <clears throat> for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Never be the unchanging Christian. You know, there used to be a rule in the state of Texas. It, they stopped teaching it right before uh, I took my uh, driver's education the first time. I know this because my driver's head teacher told us this. The rule, and some of y'all might have learned this when y'all were taking, uh, when y'all were learning how to drive. The rule used to be that you drove, when you got onto an on-ramp for, the, for a highway or freeway or whatever, you stopped and you turned and you looked and you watched until you had an open spot. Now, for those of us who drive on a freeway regularly, you're like, yeah, that, that, don't, don't do that. But when the speed limit was 40 miles an hour, when that's as fast as you could go, you could stop, you could look behind you, and you could see for a long distance and know whether or not you had space. Nowadays, if you stop on an acceleration ramp, because that's what they're called now, they're no longer called access ramps. They're called acceleration ramps for a reason. If you stop on an acceleration ramp, if you can't get into a freeway when you're doing 45 miles an hour, there's no way you get into a freeway when you're doing zero miles an hour. But people used to be taught that. And there are still people today, you run across less and less of them, but there are still people today who get up there and they get freaked out and they stop in that acceleration lane. And of course this happens. And maybe a little fender bender. Why? Because they never changed the way they did things. They had a way that worked once, and they think, hey, this is going to work in perpetuity. That means all. This is going to work all the time. I'm never going to have to change this. I learned this one way and this one way only. 
Too many Christians are no closer to being Christ-like than the day they got saved. They, they accepted Christ, they got their sins paid for, and they still do exactly the same things they did before they ever got saved. They never changed. You can always tell when a person decides to get real about God. When they start getting into studying the Bible. Not reading the Bible, studying the Bible. And when they start getting real about making God a part of their lives, talking to Him, keeping God in front. Because that person will change. They will. You cannot... Get yourself mentally involved with the Word of God and spiritually in God, involved with the Spirit of God and not have you physically involved with the work of God. That was good. Somebody needs to write that down. You cannot get your... I'm going to see if I can repeat that. You cannot get yourself mentally involved with the Word of God, get yourself spiritually involved with the Spirit of God and not have your body physically involved with the work of God. Hope I remember that. But unfortunately, what we the only time many people want to pay any kind of homage to our Lord is when they show up in a building like this. And they think that somehow showing up in a building for an hour, hour and a half, four hours of Roy's preaching then that somehow is going to have a major effect on their life. There are 169 hours in a week. Or that. 168 hours in a week. Math is not, not really important. How do you expect to spend 167 in the world and think that 167 is going to be influenced by that one. What really happens is that 167 influences that one. We need to not be stationary Christians. When the Bible says stand, it doesn't mean stand in the back. Somebody ought to write that down too. You know, before a Christian can stand, the Bible has a list of the armor of God before it tells you to stand. It says you've got to put on the armor before you're standing there. Most Christians can't name the armor of God, much less put them on. I'm going to write that down, too. Boom. <laughs> Praise God. We should not be unchanging Christians. We need to grow. We need to become more you know, if you get saved and you keep going out drinking with your buddies, how are your buddies going to know a difference in you? Why are they going to accept Christ Jesus when you're drunk trying to tell them how to get saved? They don't care. You're no different than them. You're still a sot, just like they are. You're still addicted to the same things as they are. You have the power to not be addicted. But you've chosen not to use it. And you think somehow you're going to make a difference? So let's not be an unchanging Christian. Fifth kind of Christian not to be is an impatient Christian. An impatient Christian. Psalms 37, 34. Wait on the Lord and keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Never be an impatient Christian. Now, I know you've all seen this. You're at, this happens a lot uh, when I'm taking the exit ramp from the Beltway, going to I-10. And there's two lanes. One goes west into Haiti, and the other one goes east, heading into Houston. Well, everybody's going home into Haiti during that time period, and that lane is backed up. 
So what people love to do is decide that, you know what, I'm better than this. I do not need to sit behind 20 people. What instead I'm going to do is I'm going to get out from my west hand, uh, westbound lane. I'm going to get in the eastbound lane, go all the way up to right before they split off, and then I'm going to try and jam my way in, thereby blocking both lanes. Because somehow that's better. Impatient Christian. So many times, every day, I have to say, thank you, Lord, there was no wreck right there because somebody got impatient. You know, we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now! We all have that. I wish that I could be patient. Lord, that's, that's, not, a, that's, that's not a request. Please, I got enough going on. Uh, you know, I too get upset when I'm when the lane I'm in is doing zero miles an hour and the people beside me are doing 30. Yeah. Why are we stop? Especially when you get up there and there's no wreck. You, somebody decided, hey, this is nice. We don't need to be impatient. Look, the Lord has His timing. The Lord has his perfect timing. We have our emotional timing. And I'm there. This is me right now in my life. If I have something going on, I want the Lord to do it. I want him to do it now. I'm tired of being Lord in this situation. Lord, I want you to fix this now. And God says, well, here's how you get it fixed. Lord, that's too much work. I don't want that. I want you to fix it. what I said, Kurt. I, I don't care what you said, Lord. I want you to fix this. I'm tired of being in this situation. God says, well, then do what I told you to do. But Lord, it's a light. does God talk to you like that too? He doesn't? He doesn't. Do does so what I told you to do. I watch too much TV apparently as a child. But you know, there is ways that God gives us. You know why people play the lottery? They're impatient. They don't want to go work for their money. They want a magic fairy to sprinkle money dust on them. But the sad part is, if they knew how to deal with their money, they probably wouldn't be playing the lottery because 75 to 80% of all lottery winners are in bankruptcy within the first year. And the up to the rest of them, most of them up to 99.9 uh, something percent are bankrupt within the first three years. See, we get so impatient. We have to have it now. Now, 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 now. You know, God probably has promised you things in your life, things he wants you to do. So he's probably told you, look, I want to give you this thing right here. But in order to do that, you have to go through these roads. And he's right. You have to go through those roads. His way will be the way we need to take. Remember Abraham and Sarai decided that they knew better than God. Sarai says, I'm old. How can I have kids? Look, let, let's go ahead and, and you have a child by proxy with Hagar. Thank you. And now, look what that's got. We have a Middle Eastern war for thousands of years because of one decision. Because one couple chose to do things in their timing instead of God's timing. Don't be the impatient Christian. God has something for you. Just do it in his time. Wait on him. I don't know about y'all, but I needed that. Number six, the kind of Christian not to be is a self-absorbed Christian. The self-absorbed Christian. Don't be this person. Matthew 22, 39. And the second is likened to it, Jesus says. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Don't be the selfish Christian. So this is, I know y'all have seen this. 
you're driving along and you got somebody in front of you and you can see they got maybe a big they're in the truck nobody drives trucks in texas so i'm not sure y'all see this but that, that's a joke y'all can laugh they got the big one in the back so you can see everything through right and you can see them and, and they're driving like this and then they change lanes all right they never turn their head never put on their blinker Nothing. And I'm not just picking on people in trucks. People in cars do it, too. As a side note, I think it's very funny. If, uh, if Miss Ruth's smart car out there was convertible, technically it would be a roadster. And, and that, that just makes me... Anyway, that's a rabbit. They never look. Don't care about anybody else around me. Better get them away. My road, I'm going to take what lane I want. And if you get in my way, buddy, I'm going to tell you about it. Selfish Christian. I'm sorry, the self-absorbed Christian. You know, Jesus summed up the entirety of the Old Testament in two commands. Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Loving others as much as you love yourself is half of the law. In fact, that's the half of the law that the uh, rich young ruler said he kept. Right? But we have to, that's part of it. Loving others as much as you love yourself. Now, a lot of people, as Roy pointed out the other day at Swan Manor, a lot of people want this to mean I don't do to others what I don't want done to me. That's not what it says. Love is a positive action, not a negative one. You love somebody by doing good for them, not by not doing bad for them. Not doing bad to someone is called being a human being. That, that's not godliness. That's just not being horrid. Do good for people. Love others, a positive action towards them. That's what we're commanded to do. You know, we are all naturally inclined to be selfish. We want to be selfish. I want to be selfish. I doubt in truth that no one in this room or listening on the entire world can tell me in all honesty that they never want to be selfish. We all have points and times in our lives where we want to be selfish. That's part of our sinful nature. It requires a conscious act to be unselfish. You have to choose it. Your natural body wants to be selfish. Your natural body wants to say, me, 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 I, I, I. In fact, that's even the mantra of the world today, right? Look out for number one. I even see some of these things on Facebook talk about you can't help others until you help yourself. And I'm like, well, that's almost a good idea. To act towards others as we would like them to act towards us, you must consciously think at every point, how do I want, how, if I was in their shoes, how would I want me to react towards them? What would, if I was in their shoes, what would I need me to say? If I was in their shoes, what would I need me to do? That's love. That's not our natural way of doing it. Self-absorbed Christian, don't be that Christian. We've gone through six of them. Let me list them off real, again, real quick again in case you were writing them down and I talked to you fast. Number one, the arrogant Christian. Don't be the arrogant Christian. Number two, the scaredy cat Christian. Don't be the scaredy cat Christian. Be bold. Number three, the unwise Christian. You have the gift of infinite wisdom from the Lord himself. Use it. Make your, acquit yourself of that, the unwise Christian. Number four, the unchanging Christian. You need to grow in the Lord constantly, forever. Keep growing in the Lord. 
Do not be an unchanging Christian. Number five, the impatient Christian. Wait on the Lord. Don't think to do things in your timing. Don't be an impatient Christian. Number six, the self-absorbed Christian. Other people in the world are just as important as you are. Don't think that you're more important. Don't be a self-absorbed Christian. And number seven, and I'm done, the controlling Christian. Don't be a controlling Christian. Jude 125 says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You are not in control. I'm going to talk to you about somebody who had hyper control. And this person is very respected. And I am not trying to diminish the respect of this person. I highly, highly respect this person and what they did for the Lord. But this person had to have absolute control over everything. Pastor Jack Heil was a magnificent man of God. But he didn't know his own church. And he, from his own lips, and when he was preaching, I, I heard him say, sadly not live, I had to hear, hear it on the tape, but he said that he spends, he, go, he leads his church Sunday morning, Sunday night, flies out Sunday night, goes other, where, other places to preach, flies in Tuesday night or Wednesday, or Wednesday night, preaches at his church, flies out again, doesn't come back till Saturday night or Sunday morning and then preach and does the whole thing over again. My understanding is that every single one of his Sunday school classes all taught exactly the same thing at the exact same time, and all the Sunday school lessons were written by him. I don't know if that's true. That's what I've been told. And that they just arranged the content to fit their age group. But everybody had to be teaching exactly the same thing exactly the same time out of his itinerary. Why did he do that? He did that because he was not in place to know what his church was doing, so he set up rules. You have to do things my way. If he found out somebody wasn't doing things his way, they're out. Why? Because he didn't know what was going on, so he had to hyper-control them. He couldn't sit down with people and talk to them because he was never there. But Lord, you went, you went to that church for Am I lying? Fantastic man of God. Fantastic. Poor pastor. Uh, and I don't mean that. Like I said, I'm not trying to put him down. That's the truth of the matter. That's the truth of the matter. He had to have control over everything. And the problem with that is you have to make rules. All these rules, like Pastor Howells had, all these rules. But the problem is that laws don't work. That's why we need grace. And when you're a controlling Christian, when you have to have control over everything, what you're doing is you're telling God, I got this. And you're telling everybody around you, you are less than me. You have to listen to me. And if you want to see the biggest failure in that, look at Jack Howell's hand-picked successor. Grew up in his school that his church started. Went to his college to get a doctorate degree. Married Jack Howell's daughter. Hand-picked to be his successor. And just a couple years after Jack Howell's passed to the Lord, that church went left. Why? Because Jack Howell never really knew. He was so busy about the work of the Lord, he forgot to do the work of the Lord. You know, your way might be great, but it's not necessarily the only way. There are thousands if not millions of churches throughout the world. 
Every one of them has a different pastor. Okay, well, that's not true anymore. You just have television screens. They just go into a building and watch television screens with somebody else. I don't think that's a church, though. But every one of them has their own pastor. Every one of those pastors is different. Yet, if they're called of God, that's where they're supposed to be. And it would be wrong if Pastor Lamb went over to Victory Baptist Church and said, you know what? I don't think you're right over here. It's not his job. That's the pastor at Victory's job. And it's not our job to chastise one another. I can't tell you how to live your life. I can tell you what the Bible says. But it's your job to do it. Ronnie has issues going on in his life that don't I don't know anything about. I can't tell him what's right and wrong and exactly the way he should act. He needs to be with the Lord on that. I can't do that for him. You can't do that for him. Don't be controlling. Don't think just because you have a way, that makes you perfect. It doesn't. As Christians and leaders, we must not just dictate how things should be done, but train others to think in a way that will lead them in the right way. One of the problems Jack Hiles had is he never trained people. He just gave them rules. Follow these rules. If he had trained Jack Scott, probably wouldn't have had those problems. But he assumed everything was okay because he set up rules and the guy followed rules. Well, here's a trick. Anybody who has kids knows this. You set up rules all you want to, as soon as your back is turned, those rules are broken. You don't even have to have kids. You can have dogs. Amen, Pastor? <laughs> if you have a cat, they just look at you and just do it right there in front of you. They don't, this is, uh, I, Really? You just wasted your breath, dude. You're not going to do it anyway. You know, every person is different in every, and has different directions for their life from the Lord. Every single one of them. My way is not your way. Your way is not my way. But if all of us want to do it the Lord's way, oh, now we got some. Now we got some. It's like electron. You can be going whichever way. When everybody gets together and we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing the way the electrician designed us, then all of a sudden, I might be sending data from my computer and Roy be sending data from his computer. All those are just electrons. But they're going where they're supposed to go and doing what they're supposed to do, and all of a sudden we accomplish things. Now, each one of us, we may not feel I'm all that important. If you know anything about data, ones and zeros are important. Say, I'm, I'm a zero, I'm a nothing. You're half of something. Because it takes ones and zeros. Doesn't matter if you think you're a one or you think you're a zero, you're important. Do what you need to do. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't worry about everybody else. Just do what you're supposed to do. You know, each one of us need to learn the basics. The basics. That just means studying your Bible. Knowing what the Word of God says. Do the basics. Pastor often says, if you want to know what God has for you in your life, something specific for you, the first thing you need to do is start doing what everybody's supposed to be doing. Right? You're supposed to be tithing. You're supposed to be soul winning. You're supposed to be tithing. You're supposed to be coming to church. You're supposed to be tithing. Did I say that? Did I say, did I say tithing? You're supposed to be soul winning. Do something to spread the gospel. Do something. Go out there and find some. You don't have to find. We have so many ministries right here at this church you can join. 
Just do a part of it. Some of them are so easy. We need help in every ministry that we have. Every single one of them. I don't think there's, if you went to any, any Sunday school teacher, uh, any person who's part of a ministry or over a ministry and said, hey, I'd love to help in your ministry. They go, well, gee, um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. There's always something you can do. And even if there's not something right there, that maybe that through that ministry go to the Lord and say, Hey, uh, Ms. Ruth came to us and, and she wants to do something. Lord, what do you want me to do? Then all of a sudden the Lord says, Hey, now that you got Miss Ruth, why don't you go have her start doing this over here that you never did before that you've been thinking about? You could start something that could do amazing things. But if all you do is show up and sit, and go home and gripe, basics. The second thing we each need to learn is the specific. Get the basics down. Know what your Bible says. Know what God says. Then get the specifics. Start praying about, Lord, what do you want me to do? Give me wisdom. Have I talked about that yet? Give me wisdom on what you want me to do. Third thing is the method. You need to have the basics. You need to have the specifics. And then you need to have the method. The method is pretty simple. Trust in His sovereignty. You know, the world's got a lot of ways of doing things. God has His way. He wants you to do what it is you're doing. Sometimes it's not going to be the way the world thinks. Don't be the controlling Christian because you are not the one in control. You are never the one in control. God is always the one in control. I learned that lesson myself in a very hard way. Do not think that you can dictate to God how God does things. I promise you that will hurt you more than you can possibly imagine. Because that is not a whipping post you want to be tied to. Let's get our focus off trying to be us Christians and start trying to be his Christians. Huh? My dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you tell us not only how we should act and what we should do, but you tell us what not to be, what not to do. And Lord, I know a lot of people they want to say that you're just a God of thou shalt not. But Lord, we know that thou shalt not are fences to keep us from going over to us. They are, are barriers to keep us away from briar paths. And Lord, I pray that your people right here at Garthville Baptist Church, listening all over the world, I pray, my Lord God, that we surrender ourselves to be holy be separate away from the things that we want, the things that the world puts on us and decide, my Lord God, we're going to want our hearts, our minds changed through the image of Christ Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we, each one of us, get a hold of that. Get a hold of what you want for us. And I pray if anyone here, well, I know we all here, Lord, time to time have these kind of attitudes crop, crop up on us. And I pray, Lord, you please grant us the wisdom to see it and the boldness, my Lord God, to turn from it and the grace, my Lord God, to come to repentance with the acknowledgement of the truth that you are always in control. Thank you, my Lord, for your love, for your grace, for your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen.